Hello everyone, welcome to ATN. I'm your host, Adam and Dylan. And on September 1st, 2010, changes were made to the legislation affecting the Insurance Act, which affected compensation for personal injury claims. So to clarify these changes and to give us more information, I've got in the studio today, Nanish Kotek from Kotek Law. How are you? I'm good, how are you? Thank you for having me. We're very, we love having people here that can give us information because you know what? It's interesting, this change was made, but a lot of people probably aren't aware of these changes or even what the previous legislation was. So for our viewers watching, we're going to clarify it. So right off the top, let's clarify. What was the legislation and then what were the changes that were made? Right. So let me just give you a bit of a backdrop into the compensation scheme for people injured in accidents. And then I'll take you mm -hmm. to these changes. So we have a two-tier system. Since the early 1990s, it, it, it became that way. So we have a no-fault system um, where one claims from their own insurer uh, basic accident benefits. Mm -hmm. And this could include things like income replacement benefits, treatment, and it used to be housekeeping, and attendant care, and caregiving. Mm -hmm. There's also a fault portion mm -hmm. where you uh, claim against the party at fault who caused the loss. Mm -hmm. And that is done to litigation or, or, mm -hmm. or a lawsuit. So up until September of 2010, I mean, there were some changes in the past, but I'll take you to just before then. Mm -hmm. there, were, there were more benefits, I would suggest, that people could, could access. For example, um, you could claim housekeeping benefits. Mm -hmm. um, there was caregiving benefits, in addition to income replacement benefits, and medical rehabilitation benefits up to $100,000. And if the injuries are catastrophic, mm -hmm. uh, you get a lot more. I was going to say, let's say you lost a limb. Would you get compensation for that? Yes. Um, under the old legislation, mm -hmm. um, um, for catastrophic claims, mm -hmm. um, you'd have to lose uh, really two limbs. Mm -hmm. I hate when I mean, we're looking at it in a, in a, in a way that way, but mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately that was the definition. Unless mm -hmm. it caused tremendous psychological mm -hmm. damage, when one could argue you have a catastrophic injury and you get, uh, you'll get more compensation for that. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to complicate it too much, mm -hmm. but catastrophic injuries are, are sort of really another topic mm -hmm. where there, there, there is a lot more compensation. Mm -hmm. Uh, but most injuries don't fall within that, in, in that realm. Okay. So uh, let's say you've had um, a, a shoulder injury, a back injury, but no, no fractures. So before September 2010, if you missed work, you can get 80 per, from your own insurance, you'll get 80% of your net loss of income up mm -hmm. to $400 a week unless you bought um, optional benefits to increase that, that number. Mm -hmm. Um, there'd be housekeeping benefits available too. So, and it could be a spouse. It, it could have been uh, a relative where you wouldn't even have to show the incurred expense, just the promise to pay, mm -hmm. up to $100 a week. There were caregiving expenses, which really were useful for, I, mean, I would say, stay-at-home moms, for mm -hmm. example, where they're not working. It, it gave them a benefit. They needed help looking after their kids, mm -hmm. and they would have that, uh, uh, that benefit. Um, what these changes did in September of 2010 is they took away a lot of those rights, mm -hmm. took away um, uh, much of what could be claimed under the no-fault system. Mm -hmm. um, the fault system essentially remained the same as it had been since 2003, but the no-fault, and I, I think, was, was quite what I would suggest decimated. Mm -hmm. If you want, I can give you some examples. Yes, please. Okay. Um, first of all, housekeeping has been taken out. No housekeeping claims unless you have catastrophic injuries or unless you bought, you paid more premium to buy an optional benefit. Mm -hmm. Same for caregiving expenses. Um, income replacement benefits are paid at 70% of the gross, up mm -hmm. to $400 a week, which is uh, similar to the 80% of a net. So that wasn't affected uh, uh, too much. Where I think accident victims have been, um, I'm going to be very politically correct here, but I would say harmed, mm -hmm. is with medical rehabilitation as well. Mm -hmm. Because the limit before was 100000 for non-catastrophic injuries, and that would cover such things as chiropractic treatment, mm -hmm. uh, physiotherapy, um, certain medical devices. Mm -hmm. um, it got reduced to 50,000. But hidden in the legislation, mm -hmm. and I think it was snuck in almost as, a, as, an, as really an afterthought, limited uh, medical rehabilitation benefits to $3,500 mm -hmm. if the injury is considered to fall within um, the minor injury guideline, mm -hmm. which majority of injuries unfortunately do. Mm -hmm. Now, there's been some case law recently that has sort of challenged that and it's, it, 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 the courts have held that where there's chronic pain, um, where there's psychological trauma, mm -hmm. that prima facie takes you out of the minor injury guideline and the insurance company has to show why you should still be within it. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't realize that and many people get discouraged when they're told by their insurer, um, you know, we're not approving your treatment, this mm -hmm. is all you get. 
and people aren't getting better. And it, it's causing, and we see it, frontline you know, um, litigation law who deals with this all the time. And uh, we see the effects on people when they're not getting treated how they used to be. So why would these changes even be made then? Okay. Um, you know, there's always this balancing mm -hmm. uh, between really two, I would say, political forces. One is trying to keep the premiums stabilized. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it often is a big election issue. When premiums go up, the public gets upset and they blame the government at, at hand. And also insurance companies, let's face it, they're, they're in the business of making money. They have shareholders to answer to, mm -hmm. so they want to make uh, more profits. Well, how do you make more profits? You can make the right investments, but you can also cut, try to, or limit how much money you pay out on a claim. So that's one factor, one lobbying force is the in insurance industry to, to reduce the amount of, 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 of payout. Mm -hmm. So they have theoretically greater profit. Um, also, uh, with that, the government looks at it, well, if, if insurance companies then, they won't threaten to raise premiums because they're not spending so much money out. At the end of the day, in this political battle, who suffers? It's the accident, uh, the accident victim. Exactly. And really, you know, these changes have been in since September of 2010. Like we're talking three years mm -hmm. of dramatically reduced uh, payouts on, on claims for accident benefits. The fault portion is still relatively the same. Mm -hmm. But have we really seen premiums go down? I mean, I haven't, I, I, I don't think we've seen that much mm -hmm. of it. I, I think either up or the same. So is there any opportunity for lobbyists or anyone else to go back to the government say it's been three years, it hasn't really improved anything, so why not maybe make further changes and maybe bring it back to where it was? You know, there, there is a statutory review always uh, that occurs periodically. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you find it's almost like taxes. You mm -hmm. know, once a tax is imposed, mm -hmm. HST for example, um, uh, despite lobbying against it, once it's there, once money is being made, very hard to take it away. Mm -hmm. And similarly, once um, cutbacks have been made for, for what insurance uh, uh, the industry will have to pay out mm -hmm. to, to victims of, of, of injuries, very hard to put that back in. Mm -hmm. You know, once it's, it's, it's almost like once the genie is out of the bottle, mm -hmm. you can't put that genie back in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're going to definitely get more information from you because it's a very interesting topic, but we got to take a little break. So, folks, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back to ATN. I'm your host, Damon Dillon. Still chatting with Nanish Kotek from Kotek Law. Well, you know what? You've done a really great job of yeah. clarifying all this, you know, legal talk almost of a legislation and uh, the changes to the Insurance Act. But let's clarify a little bit about at fault right. um, legislation, or I guess uh, claims I should talk about. Um, once again, maybe just recap the difference between the two, and then how do you establish that type of claim? Okay. Um, and again, I'll just reiterate, there's uh, uh, two schemes of compensation if someone is injured uh, in a car accident. Mm -hmm. The first are no-fault benefits. Um, they're regulated by statute, mm -hmm. um, income replacement benefits, a certain amount of therapy. Uh, there's another benefit called non-earner as well. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they're available um, regardless of who's at fault in the mm -hmm. accident. Now, if you are a victim of an accident and uh, it's been caused by the fault of another, mm -hmm. you can sue. You mm -hmm. can sue for pain and suffering. You can sue for uh, future health care, for income loss. Does um, it have to be 100% their fault or can there no. be like a percentage? A good point. Yeah. Um, for example, let's say it's a 50-50 responsibility. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, it could be um, uh, the witnesses are back and forth. Mm -hmm. It's hard to tell who ran the red light, for mm -hmm. example, or, or somebody made a left on a, on a yellow and mm -hmm. the person went through that yellow. There could be a portioning of, of responsibility. Let's say, for example, uh, someone's injuries are worth, hypothetically, $50,000. Mm -hmm. But if they're found to be half at fault, mm -hmm. that those damages get reduced by half, down to $25,000. Okay. So you don't have to be completely not at fault to, mm -hmm. make, to make the claim. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what's important is this. Um, uh, in an effort to keep premiums low, and, uh, and that was a the theory behind this, in the 1990s, a deductible was put mm -hmm. in place for, for awards for pain and suffering. Um, right now, and, it, and in 2003, this, it, it was increased to $30,000. That's the deductible. Now, if you go to a trial, the jury, when they award um, uh, money, they don't know about this deductible. So if they award $40,000, they don't realize $30,000 is kept by 
the insurance company or for the party at fault, mm -hmm. the person who was uh, awarded damages doesn't, doesn't get it. Okay, so that's one um, um, area that I, I would say a lot of advocates for, for, for victims of injuries have, mm -hmm. have real issues with, is that, okay, we have this no-fault system, and then we have this deductible put in. And not only is there a deductible, but to get any money for pain and suffering, um, the person's injuries have to be serious and permanent. And the, the, the legal jargon is you mm -hmm. suffer from a serious and permanent impairment of an important bodily, mental, or psychological function, mm -hmm. or you've suffered death or permanent and serious disfigurement. So if the pain and suffering is, I should say, is above $100,000, there's no deductible. But to get above 100000 you need quite significant injuries. So already, there's this threshold to meet for pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. And even if you meet it, a good chance if you won't be over 100 you lose the thirty thousand mm thousand -hmm. dollars. It doesn't mean there aren't awards and sometimes significant awards for for um, pain and suffering mm -hmm. and future income loss. And that's really the job of the advocate mm -hmm. to build that case um, uh, with the medical practitioners to prove that there is a loss that needs to be well compensated. I'm going to ask you for your opinion on this. It just sounds like it's getting harder and harder for these types of claims to go through and then for them to get any sort of compensation. Do you agree with that or is it just s sounds like it? No, it's, it, it, I absolutely agree with it. Um, uh, it's an uphill battle. You know, the All these loopholes. Uh, well, the, I'll tell you something. You know, the Insurance Act, uh, in my opinion, I, I think it's as complicated as the Income Tax Act. Now, mm -hmm. I've... Income Tax Act, I studied in law school, and, mm -hmm. I, and, and it is obviously very confusing, but mm -hmm. so is the Insurance Act. And for someone to, if you're injured, and to try to represent yourself and think you're going to be fairly compensated at the end of the day, mm -hmm. I think that's a dream. Mm -hmm. Because the legislation is complicated, there's different interests at stake, um, insurers, at the end of the day, like I said, Look, they do try to be fair, but mm -hmm. the bottom line is they answer to their shareholders. Mm -hmm. They want to save money, not spend it on, on, on claims if they don't have to. And uh, in my opinion, um, if someone is hurt in an accident, you need a lawyer. I'm from Manitoba, so right. I'm used to a very like public type of system. Yes. So here, it's, uh, I'm not very familiar with it, and right. so I'm just wondering how does Ontario compare to the other provinces in terms of insurance? Um, let me compare it to the pure no-fault systems. Mm -hmm. um, we have that, as you're from Manitoba, we have that there and in Quebec as well. I think um, the system we have is much better for uh, people who have been in accidents, and I'll tell you why. Um, under a pure no-fault system, there is no right to sue. Um, and it's an administrative process where really you, you don't have an advocate on your behalf. Mm -hmm. um, the decisions are made pretty swiftly and injuries are pegged um, uh, in certain amounts without really looking at the individual circumstances of the person. Mm -hmm. So uh, comparing us to, for example, Quebec uh, and Manitoba, I think uh, we are much better off. Mm -hmm. Now, people would argue, well, do they not pay less premiums than us? Well, we, I think we have more drivers. We probably have more accidents than they do, and that, mm -hmm. that uh, would, uh, would affect premiums. But I'm just wondering if the maybe the insurance uh, benefits are better um, because of that, right? You know, in the... Uh, it for the no-fault benefits, the statutory benefits, um, uh, they're more geared to that, mm -hmm. so that may well be the case. Mm -hmm. And I don't, uh, I don't know the full specifics mm -hmm. um, uh, because I practice in Ontario, mm -hmm. but you may be right there. But eliminating the, uh, the tort claim, the litigation mm -hmm. claim, mm -hmm. uh, where really that's where the majority of the compensation is. Mm -hmm. To eliminate that, that severely, I think, uh, impairs a victim's uh, ability to be fully compensated for their injuries. Mm. So I can I think only imagine how confusing it gets because kay. I'm just thinking of my experience in Manitoba and I know of several people that worked in insurance there and so you know it always just sounded very straightforward of okay if there's a claim if it's a good claim there's so much that they will get right and usually you know they were covered for from what I understand, um, throughout their claims, like especially in school, we would look at right. work uh, injuries, right? And mm -hmm. I always would, when we would uh, interview subjects, they'd always talk about how they could get benefits as long as they need it. So it's a very interesting topic, and I can definitely <laughs> see why people would get the debate going. We got to take a little break. We're going to have lots more coming up from you. you. But folks, we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere.
Welcome back to ATN, folks. I'm your host, Sam and Dylan. Still chatting with Nanish Kotek from Kotek Law. So we're almost out of time, but it's such an interesting topic. So, I mean, we could have so many shows on this. Let's talk about now how your uh, firm, Kotek Law, how do you help clients that have these claims and they want to come and get some help from you? Thank you. Well, we're a boutique personal injury law firm, uh, two lawyers and quite a, quite a few law clerks and uh, support staff. So we pay um, what I would say is very individual attention to each, mm -hmm. each case. Um, we don't get paid up front. Uh, we get paid at the end. Mm -hmm. So uh, even if, you know, sometimes people think, well, I don't have money. You don't have to have money. You know, uh, hopefully, if we take your case, we will get you money. So let's clarify that because yes. I know I, sometimes people yeah, are living paycheck to paycheck and then they're injured and they're just stressed yeah. out. They're thinking, what am I going to do? So they don't even think they can get a lawyer. So if you get paid at the end, so let's say the uh, claim doesn't go their way. They, right. It gets denied. They don't get anything. What happens then? Okay. Um, I can say this. We don't take cases unless we, we feel very strong Good. about okay. it. Okay. Um, and I think the cases are very few and far between where we don't get something for the, for the, for the mm -hmm. client. So we really, really run into a situation where there, where there is no money because we screen mm -hmm. uh, initially. And the initial meetings are, are free. Mm -hmm. um, there's no cost for the initial meetings as well. So we help people who've been injured in car accidents with their no-fault claim and their litigation. We help people who have been denied benefits, other benefits from insurance companies. For example, many uh, workers carry um, long-term disability insurance or short-term disability insurance through their work. Mm -hmm. um, often you have denials and we, uh, our approach on that is, is quite aggressive. We litigate those claims um, uh, uh, until the end. Mm -hmm. uh, we push for the, uh, for the most for our, our clients. Uh, slip and fall cases and, you know, and you know, people should be careful, you know, wear boots and all that. But sometimes it's inevitable. Somebody falls, there's a spill, there's there the, mm -hmm. the ground has not been salted. So mm -hmm. we assist people who have been injured uh, uh, in slip and fall or trip and fall claims as well. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes people have applied for Canada Pension Plan disability and been denied. Mm -hmm. We help people with those claims as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not just uh, uh, car accidents. We're very uh, 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 personal, we're easy to get along with. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the initial interview is, is with myself and, and, and a law clerk will, will come in as well. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, these cases take time to settle. The typical car accident case, the no-fault case, takes, I would say, one to two years to settle. Wow. And the fault case, two to four years to settle. But so what does somebody do in the meanwhile while well, they're waiting? Hopefully they're getting benefits in the meantime. Mm -hmm. And sometimes what happens is that people do go back to work, and that's great. You, know, if you, you should always get medical advice and, and try to work if you can. But maybe they don't work to the full capacity, mm -hmm. and, and we try to get that difference in income for them. So, um, you know, the hope is that they're not going to be uh, sitting back with zero money for, for four years. That doesn't exactly. usually happen. They, they tap into the benefits that are available. Mm -hmm. I want to ask because, I mean, I know a lot of our viewers, uh, a lot of them are newcomers when they're coming to Canada, so yes. they're not familiar with the system. So fantastic. You know, I'm sure from the first assessment, they'll get some information from you. Yes. But, you know, they probably are in kind of starter jobs, not a lot of income, maybe don't have family here support, have a mortgage, have all these things, um, sponsorship costs. Unfortunately, if they have an injury, I'm just trying to put myself in their shoes. So those type of clients that you see coming in, um, yes. Maybe you just talk to us a little bit about the scenario and what right. kind of other maybe resources you help them tap into when they've got all these costs and if it's taking one to two years for a claim to yes. settle, what do they do in the meanwhile? Okay. Um, you know, it's a very interesting example you've given. You could have somebody who's uh, just come to Canada. Maybe they've been working for, for a year, maybe even, even mm -hmm. less. So they, they can't access a lot of the social programs that maybe we have. They can't access Canada Pension Plan. They haven't contributed. Mm -hmm. And even with their no-fault claim, you know, under the, uh, their own insurance, or if they don't have their own insurance, they'd go under a dep uh, who they're dependent upon or they have a driver's insurance, even for the no-fault claim as well. Mm -hmm. But their benefit they're getting for income replacement benefits may not be reflective of their true, pot true potential. Mm -hmm. They may have had a great career ahead of them, mm -hmm. but were working uh, at a job with less pay to get by uh, before they progressed. So the effect of that is this, under the no-fault claim, they're stuck with 70% of the gross loss of income, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. But on the fault claim, we argue that, look, uh, the, the income loss uh, calculation must be based on their potential mm -hmm. in, in, that, in their situation and not on their past earnings mm -hmm. because they were newcomers. Mm -hmm. And we've been very successful with that argument. But you're right, it is a bit of a struggle until that case is settled with mm -hmm. the other uh, driver's insurance. Initially, they'll be getting pay from their own insurance, but it won't be truly reflective of their, of their income if, potential. What if they don't have insurance? What if it's uh, slip and fall? Okay. Right? Um, you know, and 
Correct, because there is, there, you know, we have a pure fault system for slip and fall. Mm. Um, so in those situations, somebody falls down, and if they have fractures uh, um, and uh, uh, no income coming in, uh, you know, first look to the employer, do they have short-term disability or long-term disability, and, and, and apply under it. Mm. If that's not available, um, it is a very difficult situation for people. Because, you know, in those situations, we try to advance the litigation as fast as possible. We try to ask for an advance payment mm. to help them out. Um, and really, unfortunately, the last resort is some sort of social assistance, which is very unfortunate because mm -hmm. a lot of newcomers don't want to go that route. Yeah. But that, that or they don't qualify, like you were saying. Uh, yes, there's some benefits they may not qualify or some mm -hmm. they, 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 they may, and that really is the last resort. Mm -hmm. The key then is getting good rehabilitation in play mm -hmm. to try to get them back to, to work or, 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 or a state where they could at least earn some income. Mm -hmm. yes. So, you know, I always think, especially in the movies and in media, sometimes it just seems scary to think about, you know, quote unquote, suing someone to, right. you know, if you're injured, you know, they make it seem very ugly, right? So yeah. maybe just to uh, show us a little bit of realistic uh, <laughs> view here, the types of claims you're coming in and seeing, right. maybe just overall, you know, yes, it's a year to two to settle, but you were saying most of the time you do get something for them, right? It's not of this, course. you know, ugly battle where, you know, their character is coming in and, you know, someone's trying to say that they're lying. You know, maybe explain to us a little bit about how the system is and sure. establishing proof and, you know, maybe even on the average what people are getting. So people that are considering, you know, coming, but they're just right. thinking, what's the point? I'm going to, you know, not qualify or I'm, it's just going to be a waste of time. Maybe clarify okay. for them. I mean, there always is... Um, uh, apprehension on the part of people to, to uh, uh, be involved in the court process, um, to, to make claims. But uh, keep in mind that if somebody is injured, truly injured, um, they're not being a burden on the lawyer by coming to them. They're not being a burden on the system by making an application for benefits they're entitled to. Because mm -hmm. that is the purpose of having um, uh, lawyers, that's the purpose of having mm -hmm. these benefits in the first place. So people should not hesitate, first of all. What we do is uh, we take a full interview and we really try to say, okay, where can this person, where should they be compensated? Where can they be compensated? Mm -hmm. We speak to their doctors if we have to. Um, and we make the, the appropriate realistic claims that have to be made. If it's a car accident with a no-fault insurer, with the other driver, if there's um, other policies that play long-term disability policies, we, we encourage that have them apply, mm -hmm. and if they're denied, we, we take that to, to litigation as, as well. Mm -hmm. it's, not, um, it's not a criminal process. Mm -hmm. It's not like somebody's being accused of doing wrong. They're the ones who have been wronged, okay? So, you know, that, that shouldn't be a worry. Um, uh, the stigma of, of being involved in a lawsuit, you have to keep in mind that even though the person you're suing is an individual, the lawyers are hired by their insurance company to defend them. Mm -hmm. Their insurance company is the one who pays out at the end of the day, and that's why we have yeah, in insurance. You know, there are cases, for example, where you have spouses, suing spouses. Let's say uh, the couple are driving, um, uh, the, the person driving dozes off, he or she dozes off and, and crashes and the passenger is injured. Well, they have to sue their spouse. But what's the effect of that? The premium may go up, mm -hmm. but it would go up anyway because of the at-fault accident. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it is not as personal as other types of litigation, such as family law litigation mm -hmm. or contract litigation between business partners. It's not, it's not like that. Mm -hmm. So we really like to demystify that, so to speak, mm -hmm. and, and have people, you know, if, if you're injured and, and, you, and, and you have a legitimate claim, by all means go for it. Because if you don't take that step, you're going to lose out on, on, on what's fair to you. Exactly, right. at least come in for the initial assessment. Exactly. So for our viewers that do want to get in touch, let us know how they can. Absolutely. Well, um, our website, um, kotaklaw.com, email info at kotaklaw.com, and our, our, our local number, 905-755-8900. And we're out there, happy to help. Perfect. Well, thank you so much thank for clarifying. Like I said, it's a big debate, a lot of uh, interesting facts there. So thank you so much. And folks, thank feel you. free to get in touch and definitely get some more information for yourself. Thank you so much for tuning in. You've been watching ATN. I'm your host, Amon Dillon, signing off for today's episode.